wonderful. Laura, you're going to bring you're going to bring the slides up when we get going. Yeah, I can do it now. We whenever you're ready. I just wanted to make sure that we would in this panel we would actually not just see each other, we'd see the slides. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you might put the uh the initial one up the title slide so that'd be great. And whenever you think we should start, give the signal and we'll be off. Hmm. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Were you able to see my screen just then? The beach? Yes. <laughs> All right. Whenever you're ready. Shall we start? You may begin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Luther Clark, the Deputy Chief Patient Officer at Merck, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on practical approaches to improving diversity in clinical trials. This webinar is part of the MRCT Leaning In series that focuses on key sections from the MRCT document and framework, Achieving Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity in Clinical Research that was recently released. Just next slide, please. So just by way of, next slide. So uh, I'd also like to remind you that the views and findings expressed in this document are those of the authors and do not imply endorsement or reflect the views or policies of the US Food and Drug Administration or the affiliated organization or entity of any member who contributed to this work. Individuals have served in their individual capacity. Next slide. Today's webinar on workforce development is the second in the MRCT Lean In series. This slide shows the dates and topics for future webinars, and we hope you'll plan us to join us at these as well. We have three very distinguished speakers for today's program on workforce development. Sarah White, who will both be speaking and co-moderating, Raquel Bruton, and Dr. Karen Winkler. Sarah White is the Executive Director at the Multi-Regional Clinical Trial Center of Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard, the MRCT Center. In this capacity, she is responsible for developing, defining, and implementing the overall strategy and vision for the center, as well as overseeing all management aspects of the MRCT center functions. Ms. White has more than 20 years of experience in human subject research, including experiences at both academic medical centers and industry. She is an expert in quality assurance and quality improvement processes related to execution and conduct of clinical research protocols. And while at the MRCT Center, has assisted in leading projects in health literacy, diversity and inclusion in clinical trials, and capacity building in lower to middle income countries. Our second speaker, Raquel Bruton, is a senior clinical operations lead at Biogen. Raquel graduated from Temple University with a degree in African American Studies and has more than 20 years of clinical research experience. She currently resides in the greater Boston area with her husband and three children. Raquel is a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Youth Council Chair of the Merrimack Valley Branch of the NAACP, a US track and field official, and a Sunday school teacher for her church. A third speaker, Dr. Karen Winkfield, is a radiation oncologist specializing in the treatment of hematologic and breast malignancies. She's an implementation scientist focused on improving health outcomes for underserved populations 
through community-engaged research and community-based initiatives designed to improve access to healthcare, including clinical trials. Her leadership roles have focused on developing bi-directional communication between researchers and community to ensure equitable access to care, regardless of race, ethnicity, geographic location, or socioeconomic status. She also espouses workforce diversity as a means to improve health equity. Dr. Winkfield served as chair of the American Society of Clinical Oncology's Health Equity Committee from 2016 to 2017, and now serves as chair of ASCO's Workforce Diversity Task Force. She was recently named executive director of the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance. So before moving into the presentations, a few housekeeping notes and ground rules. Please submit your questions for the panelists in the Q&A box. Following the three presentations, we will answer as many as possible at the end of the session. Also, a chat in the chat box is welcome and encouraged. So please let us hear from you. Note also that the webinars will be recorded and posted online. The, sli the slides will also be available on the MRCT website. I'd like now to turn the session over to our first speaker, Sarah White, who will provide an overview of the MRCT, the guidance document, and workforce development. Sarah. Thanks so much, Luther, and good morning to everyone on the call. Uh, Laura, can I have the next slide? Thank you. Uh, the Multi-Regional Clinical Trials Center, or the MRCT Center, um, is an academic uh, research and policy center that is very focused on improving the integrity, safety, and rigor of global clinical trials. We do our work by engaging and convening a diverse group of stakeholders, including industry, government, academia, nonprofit organizations, and patient advocates to define um, the emerging issues that create and implement ethical, actionable, and practical solutions. Over the past decade, the MRCT Center's efforts have resulted in implementation of best practices, increased transparency and safety um, for participants. And the majority of our resources are freely available uh, on our website. Next slide, please. In August of 2020, uh, which certainly seems like more than two months ago at this point, the um, MRCT Center released uh, version one of Achieving Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity in Clinical Research. And this is a comprehensive guidance document and toolkit that was really the culmination of a three-year project that the MRCT Center took on to tackle diversity in clinical research from an ethical, scientific, and practical standpoint. The guidance and toolkit, which is almost 500 pages, uh, presents the case for diversity and then really walks through various aspects of clinical research, recognizing barriers and offering recommendations and, and tools along the way. And as Luther mentioned, uh, this Leaning In series is really meant to dive into select sections of the guidance document. Next slide. The um, diversity work group was led by Richard A. Orojo from the US FDA, Barbara Beer, who's the faculty director at the MRCT Center, Luther Clark, who is our MC for today, Milena Lolek from the US FDA, David Strauss from Columbia University, and myself. Uh, and along with an amazing internal team here at the MRCT Center, we were really able to manage, create, and develop what you see today. Uh, the invaluable contributions of more than 50 work group members really represent um, a varied range uh, of stakeholders, and, and you can see where they've, where they've all come from on the screen. Um, they participated in their individual capacity um, and the, what they brought to the workforce really brought to life the guidance document. And we're incredibly grateful for their contributions and experience. Uh, next slide, please. The guidance document. Um, yes, it is very long. Uh, it really reflects a multi-stakeholder uh, contribution and consensus. Uh, it's practical and actionable. 
It includes an accountability section, um, which really identifies how stakeholders can make change in this paradigm. Uh, and then the accompanying toolkit um, provides adaptable uh, resources that um, were not easily found elsewhere. Next slide. When we talk about the clinical research workforce, um, this, is, this is who we consider. Um, it is, uh, or it is the people that are uh, conducting, uh, initiating, developing, overseeing, uh, and supporting uh, clinical research. We have been uh, intentionally broadly inclusive to, to really uh, capture everyone working in this environment uh, and recognize that depending on the research you're doing, um, the needs of the clinical research uh, resource, research workforce um, may differ. Uh, next slide. The section of uh, the guidance document that really focuses on workforce development um, brings forth a, a number of themes, and you can see those on the screen now. Uh, it really talks about sensitizing the clinical research workforce to issues of diverse participation, uh, building the number of underrepresented minority investigators and study staff, um, providing cultural competence and implicit bias training of all staff, as well as um, bringing forth the idea of health literacy and clear communication. Uh, it also recognizes the need to involve physicians in the community healthcare settings uh, and ensure that they understand clinical research. Um, and throughout the, the rest of the hour, both, both myself and, and my colleagues that are going to provide examples will really touch on a, a number of these themes. Next slide. Uh, so all of you know this, there is um, a lack of uh, diverse um, workforce, uh, and this is shown in the literature, a significant underrepresentation of minority researchers. This is not new. Uh, examples that you see on the screen date back to 2005 and 2016. Uh, and while we understand that there are a number of efforts uh, to create um, programs in this domain, I think we all agree that the efforts need to remain um, committed to workforce development in the long term and that this won't won't be um, a quick fix. Uh, and I, I'm uh, pleased to say that uh, Dr. Karen Winkfield is gonna talk a little bit about programs for workforce development a little bit later uh, in this session. So next slide. So does diversity matter for health? Uh, health? Um, and the evidence on whether patient and physician racial concordance uh, improving satisfaction and health outcomes is mixed um, this particular figure that you're looking at uh, comes from a study by Alson and colleagues, uh, and it examines whether doctor race affects uh, the demand for preventative care among African American men. Uh, the part that you're looking at is um, uh, the difference of black versus non-black um, provider take up by exam. Uh, and what you see in this case is that the evidence is in favor that patients assigned to a black doctor uh, increased their demand for preventatives um, and the effect was greater uh, as you went to more invasive procedures. So between blood pressure uh, and a blood draw for cholesterol. Next slide. Okay. Uh, here's another example for the literature. This one really focused on training of the workforce. Um, this study looked to identify successful recruitment strategies, challenges, and, and best practices for researchers to engage African American communities uh, in clinical trials. It was done by survey uh, and interviews and represents about 50 studies uh, and 25 coordinators. Uh, the figure that you're looking at are commonly used recruitment strategies. Uh, and uh, when you compare it to the analysis of the um, qualitative interview data, you find interesting that cultural competence and specifically establishing uh, a personal contact with minority or ethnic populations is critical in order to design and implement successful recruitment strategies. However, in this graph, you see that 
um, few studies, in fact, only one really included com a cultural competency training um, as a recruitment strategy. Next slide. Okay, so with, with that background, um, we'll kind of move into the themes of um, the guidance document for workforce development. And these are the minimal expectations. We're really thinking about the commitment to recruiting and training a diverse clinical research workforce, as well as training of the professional staff um, and other existing workforce uh, in cultural um, and linguistic competencies, which include implicit bias um, and health literacy. Next slide. Okay, so early on in, um, Early on in the guidance document, we set forth uh, what we saw as a model, um, as a public commitment to diversity uh, in research. And the statement here that you see on the screen is very, very much focused to inclusion of underrepresented pop populations in clinical research. Um, but I think what I'd like to reflect on here um, is that Organizations certainly do need this external commitment to diversity, um, but what we're talking about here today is really the importance of having internal policies for workforce development that support diversity, um, and that these two statements or these two commitments really need to parallel each other. Um, and I, I'm really excited to say that uh, the example that Raquel is gonna give directly after me will really show how this can play out in an organization. Next slide. We've introduced uh, the idea of cultural competency. Uh, I think this is a theme that people talk about um, very closely linked to developing a diverse workforce. Um, the chapter on in the guidance document um, goes into this. It recognizes that uh, cultures undergo change over time. Uh, and it really sets forth that if an organization um, creates and sustains um, culturally informed um, workforce that over time they're able to understand the background and the cultures that are going to be included in the populations. They understand the norms and the lifestyles of those people that they're bringing in to work with. Um, and they really are able to develop a preferred um, and even comfortable way to communicate, listen, um, and ask questions to those um, that will be included in the in the um, intended population. Um, this is certainly uh, not something that happens overnight. Um, it is a long-term effort. It's an iterative process, uh, and we really call for leadership in organizations um, to to take this on and, and model it and and trickle down. Next slide. So we provide an example here of how cultural competence can really help um, participants feel more comfortable. And, and this is specifically looking at uh, individuals of the Islamic faith um, uh, and really thinking about understanding the background and, and culture as well as their lifestyle uh, and how it's critical to do that uh, in order to accommodate them. Uh, specifically for those of the Islamic faith, um, understanding the uh, time and place of prayer, how Ramadan may impact participation, um, any dress requirements or requirements for interactions between women and male clinicians um, can and should be understood um, when engaging uh, with these participants. Um, and I think perhaps most importantly, um, being able um, to ask them how you can accommodate them, depending on the time of year, depending on the invasiveness of that study. Um, and I think this really should be considered from a broader perspective, uh, and those in the workforce directly interacting with participants should be in the mindset of really understanding um, how can I accommodate any patient, the patient in front of me or the patient that's coming in, um, how, how they can accommodate them uh, to feel comfortable in the study. Next slide. Okay, we, take, uh, we take the time 
uh, in the guidance document to address the importance of the role of the healthcare provider. Uh, they certainly do play a key role in raising awareness of the clinical research. They're a trusted resource to patients uh, and can explain the research um, in the context of the potential participants' um, uh, particular health or condition. Um, they frequently serve as critical referral agents uh, and collaborators uh, for those investigators conducting research. But I think we all very much recognize that healthcare providers face barriers. They have limited time, limited information about the ongoing clinical research, and, and in some cases may have limited information or knowledge regarding clinical trials and some of the innovative and complex protocols that are ongoing. Um, I think it, it harms incentive uh, if they fail to receive information about their referred um, patients. Um, we, we see this play out at major academic centers, uh, and I think as you move outside of the academic centers to private practice and even community health centers, you're that much further removed from the research going on. I think it's very important that organizations, as they take on training of healthcare providers, to really think where do the healthcare providers get their information? Um, how can we incorporate research into that information, whether it's a hospital or a division newsletter, sponsor presentations at conventions, um, or other initiatives from sponsors on their website to really actively engage and, and clearly communicate the research uh, that's going on. Next slide, please. So in addition to investigators, uh, having a well-trained study team uh, and research staff, um, it, it, it's just incredible to ensure that, that participants um, are clearly communicated with and feel accommodated. Frequently, it is um, the study staff uh, and the team that is interacting with the potential participant first. Um, and that really speaks to the need of their training. Um, I think this is achievable um, by sponsors during study startup uh, meetings where they can find all the staff um, with comprehensive diversity training that goes beyond the training of the protocol uh, and really reflects um, some of the check marks here that you can see on the screen. Uh, and at major academic medical centers, frequently coordinators are coming in in May and June and July, um, and it really presents an opportunity as you're onboarding these coordinators to train them in these different areas. Um, and certainly young coordinators may especially benefit uh, from this training. Next slide. Um, we have a number of examples in the chapter on workforce development um, that really speak to every stakeholder being responsible for increasing the opportunities and improving the mentorship and, and training of the diverse investigators and study staff. Um, again, uh, Karen is going to give the example from the American Society of um, Clinical Oncology, and you'll get a chance to really hear um, how that works. Um, across the across the organization. Next slide. The last section of this chapter speaks to health literacy and clear communication. Uh, and this is an area that the MRCT Center has spent quite a lot of time with to date. There are a number of factors that influence an individual health literacy. Um, and rather than um, feeling that the listener needs to increase their health literacy. Um, we really take it from a different direction um, and instruct the communicator uh, to be responsible for developing and sharing health information that is understandable to the literature. Um, and this clear communication is certainly important for successful engagement um, of diverse populations. Uh, next slide. We present uh, a number of best practices in health literacy uh, in the chapter. We also talk about how not only the consent form needs to be presented in a health 
uh, literate way, but all information throughout the entire protocol uh, life cycle uh, needs uh, to be clear to participants uh, in both in written uh, and oral communications. Next slide. We reference um, the MRCT Center's Health Literacy and Clinical Research website. Um, this is a website completely dedicated to uh, the foundation of health literacy and different elements of health literacy. Um, and you can see in, in the grid on the right, um, the many, many tools and resources um, that we have uh, available uh, for the public. Next slide. Uh, the chapter on workforce uh, development concludes like, like most of the other chapters in the diversity guidance document with a set of recommendations. I'm not going to walk through each of these individually. I'd love to leave extra time for our, our colleagues that are about to speak uh, and any questions. Um, but I do want you to know that there are recommendations there. Uh, next slide. Um, what, what is um, good to point out also that in the accompanying toolkit, um, a number of logic models have been put together. And these logic models conclude with key performance indicators. Uh, and we all talk and we have heard that um, in this effort to increase diversity, not only in clinical trials, but in the workforce, um, we need metrics and we need to track this. Um, and the toolkit um, for workforce development sets, sets forth not only the short-term output indicators that can be tracked, but also the long-term outcome indicators that can be tracked. And, and this is really a beginning for organizations to take. You may need to modify it depending on your organization, um, but to take and use in order to track. So with that, it is now my pleasure to turn the presentation over uh, to Raquel, who has been a colleague over the past three years uh, in the diversity work group. And it's, it's certainly been a pleasure uh, to work together and I'm thrilled um, that you're presenting. So over to you, Raquel. Great, thank you, Sarah. Uh, next slide, please. So, I am Raquel Bruton. I am one of Biogen's clinical operations lead, and I currently oversee uh, a few of Biogen's phase one clinical trials in the area of ALS. But for today's presentation, I wanted to focus on workforce development as it pertains to our actual clinical trials. So, at Biogen, where science meets humanity, in analyzing where we were and where we wanted to be in terms of diversity and inclusion, we set about uh, listening, uh, not um, thinking that we knew the territory or the terrain, but we really wanted to learn and engage in the communities that are specific to our therapeutic areas. Of course, our goal is to increase our trial participation numbers. Um, and we know that uh, building a sustainable, transparent, trustworthy relationship with the community is paramount. So in the different community organizations, it's not just a, a helicopter approach of coming in, getting information and leaving, but it's building and cooperating and having this relationship where we can go back and forth. A part of doing that was that our global clinical operations team, led by our patient engagement group, formed a UP champion, so that's underrepresented population champion team. And this team is multi-departmental, so it's not just one group or one department that's leading it, it's many stakeholders that are involved. In our listening campaign, we were able to have over 1,700 attendees across the U.S. just in 2019. In terms of our collaboration, we have collaborated with the uh, Center for Information and Study on Clinical Research Participation, so that's C-Script, and with the National Minority Quality Forum. So those are strategic collaborations that we have moving forward. Next slide. 
So our area of focus, um, as a work group member, I remember looking at this quote, and I think it's worthwhile to read it, the success of any given workforce development program, however, is evident only through measuring improvement over time, which could be indicated by a shift in research study enrollment numbers, a value change in implicit association bias results, and or through a statement of commitment from the executive level at an organization. So at Biogen, while our uh, head, our CEO has had the statement and committed to it, it's not just coming from our head, it's actually coming from all, all parts of the organization. All departments have their own statement on how they plan to address um, the underrepresented, underserved. And that really helps because in 2019, when we set about our community engagement and awareness, we needed to make sure that this information was uh, relayed internally. Um, we wanted to talk specifically to the patients and the healthcare providers to get their insights. Um, even engaging in the FDA and the industry working groups such as C-Script and uh, National Minority Quality Forum. As with the workforce development, internal awareness and education is key. We don't assume that everyone working on our studies is aware of the different challenges involving the different populations that we're seeking. So, our patient engagement group has gone about developing a portal, a training portal specific to this topic. So for 2020, we, I've highlighted it here in green, we are continuing to build our community engagement with our trusted partners. What's interesting here is that on our study level, so we'll have a program that this talks about the compound, but specific to each study, we have unique diversity um, in objectives established for each of those studies. And even our protocols and way they're designed. So we're not, we're looking to analyze the patient burden. Are there some visits that can be adjusted? Do they need, do we need this many blood draws. So analyzing all of that information to make sure that we're really changing the way in which we design our protocols, not uh, excluding particular populations and not really knowing it. As we talked about with workforce development, site selection is key to us. So it's really easy when we're starting up a study to go with the sites that we know, but we are partnering with community organizations to bring um, sites and investigators of color into our site list and to work with them and become a part of our key, key sites that lead and drive some of our programs. And we continue to utilize our, our global clinical operations champions. That these, these groups of folks meet on a monthly basis and drive the agenda forward. So it's not just a passing topic, but it's continually being evaluated. Next slide. So how do we take that focus into action? That actually means that we have a strategy that's being built out. When we, look, when we work with our epidemiology group, we're looking specifically what is the targets that each of the compounds should actually have. If, if African Americans make up 13% of the, um, the population in the US and they make up X amount of this particular indication, then our study should have a proportion, a percentage of those patients. So moving forward in 2020, we actually have a goal even before the studies started up so that we're not looking backwards trying to capture that information, but we're really baselining our study with the intention of including these populations. Interesting to note is that we always have to align with vendors. We can't assume that our vendors have the same business objectives that we do, or even that they know what our, object, our objectives are. So even on a partnership level, we discuss, we are interested 
in including the underserved, underrepresented populations in our trials, and we need to align on this fact. It goes even further with the third party uh, vendors. They tend to be some that are on the ground. We want to make sure that they actually look like the community in which we're going into. So it's a workforce development, I feel, is on a sponsor level. We have the ability to make the change even in the vendors that we choose. Um, we continue with our community advisory boards um, and in particular, our investigator meeting. So being intentional there of including a slide even that says we are looking for these particular patients. We are developing patient facing, patient facing materials for you. We are developing trainings for you, helping and assisting you to approach these subjects because we know that these subjects are just not being asked to participate. That's that's a big key. And with any, as with everything, and Sarah mentioned this already, we have metrics. So we've developed a dashboard uh, for each of the studies that have been baseline to see how we're measuring. We can, you know, we can talk all day, but the numbers will speak for themselves. And developing a dashboard that keeps us in line with our objectives is, is what we have committed to. Next slide. So this is my last slide here, and I wanted to highlight the uh, one of our one of our trials, and it's the lupus program in particular. So for lupus, we know that it predominantly affects women and disproportionately affects women of color. And uh, here we know that previous trial information does not have enough of these participants. So we are in the process here of starting up a new trial and the team has a great opportunity to really uh, take a step back and form the foundation of this particular study in the right way in which we are listening to the actual patient journey. So that's centering the patient, not using a vendor to share their story, but having to speak directly to uh, a lupus patient and their challenges, which helps us to better design a study protocol. We're finding that our findings, if you're looking at an overall program, they need to be applicable to a diverse population. So with the different um, variations of lupus, we are ensuring that we are getting the adequate number of participants so that the uh, information can be applicable to the population. In terms of a specific engaged, underserved, underrepresented plan for lupus, we know that it's multifaceted. So in terms of access, we're improving the access and opting, opting in and out of our clinical trials. Of course, empathy is always a part of the work that we do because we know that there is a lack of trust. In terms of action, we are purposely seeking investigators and site staff in communities of color. And our strategic plan starts before study activation, which is paramount. It's nothing worse than trying to backtrack once you've started the study. And so just to wrap up here, our goal is the fee to focus on our feasibility and our site selection, being strategic about that keeping focus on the patient, uh, continually uh, interacting with our patient advisory boards and taking their insights to change and develop the uh, study protocol design, and then making sure that our recruitment materials and our in community engagement, even the pictures we choose, whether it be caricatures or actual pictures, reflect the full variation of people of color. And so with that, I would like to thank you for your time and I would like to transfer over to Dr. Karen Wingfield. Thank you so much, Raquel. And thank you everyone for joining. And I definitely want to um, thank the MRCT for the invitation to join today's discussion. I'm gonna frame my comments today um, really specifically about workforce diversity, although I'll talk a little bit about workforce development. And of course, I'm gonna give an example that's gonna be related to cancer because 
I'm an oncologist, so that's what I'm going to do. Next slide, please. Some of you may have um, seen this AACR Cancer Disparities Progress Report. It actually was, um, it came out last month. And the reason why I bring it up is because I want folks to understand the reason why this conversation is so important, right? I think we all know, we've heard a lot with COVID about all of the healthcare disparities. So it's not just specific to cancer, but since cancer is the number two cause of death in this country and will soon eclipse cardiovascular disease, this is an important um, topic in which to frame this discussion about the importance of workforce diversity and workforce development in, in accessing clinical trials. Now, if you haven't had a chance to read the report because it is lengthy, um, this is really specifically around legislation. Um, and so they did provide a legislative briefing and that has been recorded and is on YouTube so you can look up AACR cancer disparities legislative report I think it dropped on the 16th of last month in September and it would really just give a nice synopsis of some of the, the items um, that really need to speak to the or speak to the importance of diversity in clinical trials next slide please one of the important things is to think about where we've been over time in the country with respect to cancer outcomes and the beautiful thing is, is that there certainly has been an overall decline in cancer deaths, as you can see, um, when we look at um, the differences that we've seen over time, particularly the disparities, right, the gap, we've moved from a gap of 33% difference between blacks and whites to 14%. But I like to show people the, the, the snapshot on the right, because while we certainly have made progress overall with respect to cancer, we see that these curves are declining for everyone there's still a significant gap, particularly for black men, but we also see that there's still a gap for black women as well when it comes to mortality related to cancer outcomes. Next slide, please. And this is a recent update of the top four cancers that we see in the United States. It's incidence and mortality broken down by race ethnicity. Um, and What's fascinating is the top left corner, that panel on lung cancer, um, three years ago, last snapshot, remember the data is always about three years behind, um, blacks actually had a much higher incidence of lung cancer. Now they have about the same incidence as white people. And same thing with black women um, with female breast. If you look on the right side, I used to say, well, black women had a lower incidence of breast cancer. Now, frankly, they have about equivalent incidence of, of breast cancer as white women. But the fact of the matter is for all four of the top cancers in the United States, black people are dying at much higher rates. So if you look at the, the bars on the, on the right, the mortality um, in the blue, we see that African-Americans are dying of cancer at a much higher rate than everyone else. Next slide, please. And you know, I'm a biochemist, right? So I'm a basic scientist. I also do population health science, but listen, my career started as a basic scientist. And one of the things that I wanted to understand are, are these differences. Because again, this is not new data. The data specifically related to cancer has been out there for decades. The data specifically related to all of the differences that we see in terms of race ethnicity have been out there for a long time. But again, I'm gonna frame this within cancer. So if you think about nature versus nurture, are there biologic determinants? Are there genetic variances between populations that can impact you know, one's outcomes or is it really just related to social determinants? Well, as a scientist, one of the things I want to do is look and see if I could find some biologic or genetic differences. But a challenge that I had at many of the institutions that I found myself is that there weren't enough samples from black participants to really do some of the comparative genomics or comparative proteomics that were very instrumental in terms of understanding those differences. And so that really spoke to the fact that blacks were not participating in clinical trials at the same rates. And that started my thinking just in terms of access to care in general. And that's what really changed the focus of the work that I do in understanding what access to care means for underserved populations and how can we design programs that can really help change the dynamics. Next slide, please. This is really important because this report that was done by the Institutes of Medicine came out in 1999, Unequal Burden of Cancer, right? And it was really an assessment of NIH research programs. And so, next slide, please. One of the things that the Institutes of Medicine was, was charged with was really not only just reviewing kind of all of the cancer research related to minorities across all of the NIH um, institutes. This is not just about the National Cancer Institutes, but all of them, 
was really, if you look at number three, examining the adequacy of NIH procedures for equitable recruitment and retention of minorities in clinical trials. And check this out, next slide please. One of the recommendations that came out from this report is the importance of increased representation, right? And that's not only just related to um, intramural, right? Intramurally within the NIH, making sure there was diverse representation, people who looked like the communities that we were hoping to serve within the body of the NIH itself. That was an important strategy that was outlined by the Institutes of Medicine. But as you can see, they also talked about, you know, report, uh, report on recruitment and retention of minorities. Also, what is the accountability that we needed to have? Plans to address survivorship. And again, survivorship is a part of research as well. And are we being inclusive in thinking about the communities that are, have some of the worst outcomes? This was an important strategy. But again, this came out over 20 years ago. And frankly, not much has changed. Next slide, please. So one of the things that was really important was the Sullivan Commission. Again, this report came out in 2004, Missing Persons, looking at the medical professionals themselves. So that's why I'm talking about workforce diversity, because we're talking about who are the individuals that are caring for the people who, again, have some of the worst outcomes. And frankly, blacks across the board, I don't care if you're talking about HIV, AIDS, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, infant mortality, black individuals in the United States have the worst health outcomes of all racial and ethnic groups. And so it really begs the question, why are we not being more inclusive of them in clinical trials when they really have the highest burden of diseases? And so one of the things that the Sullivan Commission said was that increasing ethnic diversity amongst physicians may be the most direct strategy to improve healthcare experiences for members of ethnic minority groups. And in fact, one of the things that Sarah talked about was some of the studies that showed that patients had greater satisfaction. There are lots of studies that show that when there's racial concordance between patients and their doctors or physicians, that those patients are more likely to engage in the, um, in the in interventions. Why would clinical trials be any different? Well, frankly, we don't have a crap ton of data. And the reason why is because we don't have enough diversity in the research staff. We don't have enough diversity in the investigator pool to really have robust data to show that racial concordance actually makes a difference. Next slide, please. So this is where we find ourselves. When we look at the top two causes of death in the United States, cardiovascular disease and cancer, we have less than 3% engagement in the black community. Again, despite the fact that they have the highest morbidity and mortality from both of those. And so we do have some work to do. Next slide, please. And my hope today is to really make sure that we're thinking about workforce diversity really broadly as a way to improve access to care. And the way that I think about care, the way that I think about medicine, is that clinical trials shouldn't be something that's extra or different. It should be part of how we care for people. It should just become a part of the natural landscape. Now we know that that's not always the case because much of what happens, and I'm going to speak again to what happens with cancer, many of the clinical trials happen in the setting of comprehensive cancer centers or academic practices. There are some community-based practices that do have clinical trial availability, but not always. Um, and so that's one of the things that I'm working on with the, the NCI, the NCORP Research Group, that's the NCI's uh, Clinical Oncology Research Program, where we have over 1,000 sites that are community-based sites where we're working on how do we expand access to clinical trials by bringing clinical trials to people. But again, this whole issue of workforce diversity where patients see people who look like them, who have those same backgrounds, they really do have a tendency to say, I have better, I'm getting better care, and they have higher levels of patient satisfaction and better health outcomes, frankly. I'm not sure if many of you may have seen, there was recently a paper that showed that, you know, we know that black women um, die, um, have a higher um, uh, maternal, fe uh, maternal demise um, at the time of giving birth, but there was a recent paper that showed that the babies of those women who are born where they're being taken care of by black physicians, those black babies actually do better. So outcomes are better. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the work that I've personally been doing um, in this space. These are a couple of references for, your, for you to take a look at. 
it's a shame that we have to kind of say why does workforce diversity matter, but we do. And so um, my colleague and I, um, Dr. Gibbo, back in 2013, um, wrote a paper that really described why it's important, it's specific to oncology, but these are, these are broadly applicable um, in whatever field you want to talk about in medicine. Um, but similarly, working with the American College of Radiology, talking about diversity and inclusion, and I must, I'm going to point out the, the one on the bottom, which is the ASCO strategic plan around um, increasing racial and ethnic diversity. I was really honored to lead that task force and that came up with a strategy for ASCO. So we're talking about how institutions, right, can work. And we'll talk a little bit about that. But ASCO is an organization that really doesn't have direct impact per se on what happens on, on the ground. Um, so how can an organization like ASCO that doesn't have uh, the capacity to hire faculty or, or trainees or any of that, how can, how can ASCO impact what happens um, in those spaces? Next slide, please. So I must say that ASCO has been in this space for a very long time. In 2009, they really started their diversity and oncology initiatives. Um, there are many things that are important to note. Number one is pipeline development. So part of the challenge when we look at medicine um, there are fewer than 6% of Blacks who are going into medical schools and graduating, probably about 7% Hispanics. And so if we think about what the U.S. demographics are, that falls short of what we're seeing in the demographic population, which is fine. But in oncology and in other subspecialties, we know that Blacks only comprise 3%. Of, on of the oncology workforce. And so we really have to think about pipeline. So ASCO has been really forward about thinking about this for years, where we have a medical student rotation, students are able to spend eight to 10 weeks working and getting a clinical exposure to oncology. We know that many African Americans and Blacks in this country are not being trained at institutions where they have oncology practices on board. So it's important for that exposure to happen. So students can say, that's interesting, I want to do that. Same thing with residents, right? So if you're an internal medicine resident or general surgery resident, and you're interested in thinking about careers in oncology, you know, or maybe not, maybe you just need exposure. There's a resident travel award that actually provides funds for those trainees to actually attend the annual meeting and get exposure to uh, a variety of different um, people who are in the oncology workspace. But these rotations, these travel awards are specific to individuals from backgrounds that are traditionally underrepresented in medicine. So we're talking about the standard, you know, Black, Hispanic, Native American, really important to make sure that they have the exposures that they need so that they can even think about careers in oncology, right? We want to have the clinicians who are there, who can become the principal investigators, who can then really be huge proponents of the clinical trials that will allow for diverse participation. Now, in addition, virtual mentoring programs, there's the oncology scholars rotation, which is a shorter rotation because we've heard from some of the historically black college and universities, they can't do eight to 10 weeks away, right? So thinking about our communities, hearing from our communities, and I use the term communities broadly because there's different types of communities. There's the community of, of educators, there's the community of clinicians, there's a community of the, the lay individual population. Really important, we've heard community engagement talked about already but it's important to listen to the community. So that's what ASCO did. They heard from the student body that eight to 10 weeks was way too long and they couldn't do it. Um, the bias training is really important, not just for scientific reviewers of papers and, and studies, but also for staff at large. Next slide, please. And um, this is really important because we know that racism exists. We know that implicit bias is real. We've seen studies for years. Uh, remember the cardiovascular trial that looked at even intervention, how many individuals are getting cardiac catheterization, same symptoms, but black person, white person, black male, white woman, whatever it is, we know that there was bias, even though the scenario was the same, that there was prep provider bias. And this is important. This is a study that we just did, actually a paper. It's not really a study, but it does talk about some of the historical context of why racial justice matters. Again, framed in radiation oncology, but many of the tips outlined in this paper actually can be broadly applied. There are the personal, there's personal work that needs to be done to understand implicit biases that we may have. All of us have them. It's just a matter of what degree. And then there's also suggestions on what organizations and institutions can do in the form of ATIP, really thinking about how they can actually try to turn the tides related to some of the issues that can help us focus on creating more workforce diversity 
and also thinking about ways that we can improve access to care. Next slide, please. This is one of the other initiatives that ASCO has. So ASCO has their um, ASCO University or ASCO eLearning. Now they do have this role of cultural competency in reducing cancer disparities and it talks about you know, that importance of understanding cultural differences. I do not like the term competency when it comes to culture. Uh, no one is really gonna be able to be competent in my experience as a black woman in the United States, in my individual experience. I really enjoy the term culture humility um, and development of materials that are culturally appropriate or culturally sensitive. Um, but nevertheless, this is the terminology that was used and I was involved in this, but I couldn't dissuade them from using the terminology, but there it is. Um, but there is training material. There's training materials that are online and they speak about the importance of not just the, the clinicians and the physicians having these training, but all staff, any staff that may have impact with patients. Pick up the phone. Who's the first person a patient talks to, right? I can tell you some horror stories about the work that I was doing in the Hispanic community in Boston, where I'm doing all this work, boots on the ground, and we're getting Hispanic men to agree to enroll in his prostate cancer trial, and the person on the phone didn't treat them with respect. So they declined to participate. Really important for us to not just think about that. That's where the workforce development piece comes in. Next slide, please. Assembling the right team is critical. We know that the, the development and workforce diversity is going to take a long time when we're talking about the clinician workforce, right? My training took over 23 years. Yes, it did. <laughs> of course, I was one of those silly ones who did MD and PhD. But still, 23 years of schooling, that takes a long time, right? So we don't have time to wait. We've got to act now. The urgency is now. So what are the things that we can do to assemble the right team to improve not only workforce diversity and thinking about all of the providers? Susan, um, Sarah spoke to this a little bit. The social workers, the nurses, APPs, financial counselors, counselors, navigators, nurse navigators, lay navigators, community health workers. But I cannot tell you, please, 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 I can't say this enough. Do not underestimate the value of volunteers. They can change the face of what happens in clinical trials. And that's why the community engagement piece is vital. Next slide, please. I do want to point your attention to this particular paper that came out earlier this year in contemporary clinical trials. This was a study that, that was um, uh, performed by uh, Jeannie Regnanti. She did some qualitative interviews with some of the top institutions in the country that actually have um, participation rates of minorities that are 20% or above. So I want to point your attention this again. I want to provide some references for folks so they can take a look at things and not just hear my voice, but really to have some hard references to take a look at. So please, 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 if you get a chance, take a look at this because there's some very interesting um, things to consider. Next slide, please. And on that, I want to thank you so much. Um, I do want to say one of the things that's important is making sure we're reaching people. And that's what we try to do with the podcast, The Black Dots. So please take a listen if you haven't. Thanks so much. Right. So, so thank you to, uh, to all of our speakers. We're, we're, we're very close to the, uh, the end of the session. So, but we have some great questions that have come through. So I'm going to uh, ask our panelists if they might be able to stay on just a few minutes uh, extra to uh, try to get through some of these and if you'll give uh, brief, uh, brief answers. So, so the, there, there were a series of questions for you, uh, Raquel, in terms of your work with, uh, with vendors. Uh, how, how do you, in fact, engage with contractors as it relates to, uh, to diversity and also uh, the, your ability to attract? So would you, let's, let's begin with you and if you would just respond to, uh, to some of those issues. Sure, I would love to. So I think the question is the engagement goals for the recruitment. Are we including this in the contracting process? So yes, Biogen has a partnership. I know that there are different models uh, that sponsors have with CROs, but our, our particular model is a partnership model. So our diversity objective is handled on the partnership level. So it's taking it from the top down where those agreements are being made. In terms of the third party uh, vendors that we utilize, um, we're engaging with them specific uh, to diversity. So it's clear there that our um, diversity targets are a part of the agreement. I see here another question. Do you frequently face challenges in achieving your epidemiology goals? So we're just building out our epidemiology um, uh, 
uh, data with our internal epidemiologist. Um, I think here it may find it uh, challenging to achieve those recruitment targets while aligning with those goals. Do I face any pushback? Since the epidemiology group is internal, it's giving us a goal post because we weren't even using anything to guide it here. So if we have the data that shows X number of patients are in this region, in this country, then we will set appropriate targets for each of our trials as they um, relate to the prevalence of the indication. Another question here, do you track your PI and your advisor diversity? Um, I don't think we're currently doing that. Um, and our patient engagement group, um, I can bring that back to the group, um, but uh, we are purposely seeking investigators of color. I don't think we we have on our investigator list whether what their what their race or ethnicity is. Um, and then the last question here: Do you want to make your dashboard public? Actually, our dashboard comes. I really would suggest you utilizing the toolkit because it has the key performance indicators there. And they're going to be specific to your therapeutic area and how the metrics relate to your organization. And I, and I think the uh, KPIs that are listed in the tool kit, um, diversity toolkit is a great starting point. And I think I had, that was it for my questions. Did I get them all? Sure. Well, for, well, for this moment, uh, so it, so each of our each of our speakers did make some comments around trust, and there's a question specifically for you, Karen. But I, I would post it for all the speakers, particularly as it relates to uh, how workforce development uh, might be helpful uh, in that regard, and also what pharma companies uh, can or should be doing to uh, increase uh, trust. So, Karen, why don't you start? Yeah, sure. That's a great. That's a great question. I'm looking at some of the comments in the chat box around why is this focused on African Americans. I specifically focused my work on African Americans because they have the worst outcomes, and, and disparities in outcomes is what is driving some of the financial challenges that we actually see. We spend over forty billion dollars, um, and actually over one trillion dollars a year, frankly, on disparities related to African Americans. That's where my focus was, and that's one of the underserved populations that we know has had distrust and mistrust, um, frankly. I mean, if we talk, think about Tuskegee and, and Henrietta Lacks, trust is vital. So one of the things that I think that pharma can do, um, and they've started to do this more, is really start to partner with community-based organizations, advocacy groups, really vital to do that. Um, there's a particular company that I used to work with called Bridge, um, which is um, a clinical research, a CRO that really focuses on um, engagement of minority communities, but also will pair pharma with um, investigators of color and we'll do some training, right? So I know that capacity building can be an issue for some um, pharmaceutical companies because you want to get your studies up and running. And so that's why you keep going to the same institutions over and over again because you know they have the infrastructure. Bridge will help kind of fix that, right? They'll help you train sites. And so that's an important thing. Um, trust doesn't happen overnight. And so it's important to be visible, to be present, to be there just because, not only when you need something, not to just jump in and out when you want black people or Asian people or Hispanic people to join a clinical trial. Presence is important. And so I actually like to point to some institutions like Bristol Myers Squibb, where their foundation has been very present um, in thinking about not just uh, racial and ethnic uh, disparities, but also geographic disparities. And they've been um, very instrumental in creating ways to provide money and funding, for instance, to Stand Up to Cancer, which has a very unique structure and way that they do research and build research teams. But it allows for them to provide funding where research can be done that actually requires, requires research teams to be inclusive in the way that they develop their translational research. And so oftentimes that does mean including individuals from the communities you're hoping to serve at the time of development. Don't wait till after the clinical trials already developed. Bring them in early, bring them into the process. And there are more and more training programs that are helping patients, survivors, and advocates learn about research so that they can be more valuable to our partners. 
Yeah, if I could just quickly speak to, you know, why focus just on African Americans and just to reiterate Dr. Wingfield's point, uh, uh, African Americans do have the worst outcome. For Biogen, we're following the science. So if it's specific to lupus, and we know that lupus disproportionately affects women of color, we need to make medication that is treating the intended population. So we need to include them in the trial. Great. Okay. Um, so, so Sarah, um, will, is, is there the opportunity for additional questions that may not have been able to be answered uh, during the, this and other sessions? And are we capturing the Q&A? Uh, thank, yeah, thanks, Luther. Um, we will capture all of the Q&A. Um, and I think um, our intention um, is to build uh, an FAQ um, on the, the diversity website, which is in process of, of being built. Um, the FAQs won't be answered um, in the next week, um, but we are collecting them and considering them. Um, and certainly if there are questions that um, relate to the information in the upcoming Leaning In series, we will absolutely make sure that we incorporate them. Um, and I would, I would just defer to Laura. Um, who is the master organizer of all of this in case I have said something wrong there. Great. I think that you're spot on. Thanks, Sarah. Great. Okay, uh, great. So we've gotten some wonderful comments about the outstanding uh, presentations of today. I think we are out of time, but why don't we finish up, uh, Laura, by showing the last couple of slides that indicate when our next uh, Lean In uh, series webinars are and where do we go from here? Great. So, so just a, uh, a, a heads up, our next uh, Lean In webinar will be November 18th from 11 a.m. to 12 noon uh, Eastern time, focusing on study design eligibility, site selection, and uh, feasibility. And as you can see, another group of really outstanding uh, presenters, Dr. Barbara Beer, uh, Laura Mel Melanie, uh, Raquel Funds and Teresa Devins. So I'd like to uh, thank all of our speakers for the outstanding job you've done. Really thank uh, go to our uh, participants and the excellent uh, questions and engagement uh, from you. So please keep it coming and we look forward to your being a part of our next series. And on the final slide here again, uh, the series of presentations that will be coming up over the next several months. So with that, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Sarah uh, if she might have any closing comments. If not, we'll turn it over to you, Laura, and we'll call the program to close. Thank you, Luther. No closing comments for me. Just a very big thank you to our speakers. Uh, and thank you for all of those attending the webinar. And we look forward to, to having you back on November 18th. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. So with that, uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.